Welcome to the module on cardiopulmonary resuscitation, or CPR. Welcome to the master course on urgent care brought to you by Cruza. This is a module briefly reviewing cardiopulmonary resuscitation. We've all been there. A client walks through the door carrying a limp dog or cat in their arms. It's pretty clear to tell that something is very, very wrong in this situation. You do an initial examination as a clinician and you realize immediately that the cat or dog has no heartbeat at all. You start CPR and prepare the owner for the worst. Well, it can be very easy to think that once a patient arrests, it's impossible to get them back. Veterinary CPR survival rates are actually about 35 to 45% initial return of spontaneous circulation and six to 7% survival to discharge. While that last number still sounds really small, it's very, very important to owners that we try and do our best by the patients. So let's talk about how we can do that. The most important part of a successful CPR is preparedness and prevention. Preparedness and prevention means we have appropriate training and we have all of the tools and instruments that we need to carry out a successful CPR. Appropriate training includes routine, didactic, and hands-on practice. In fact, a six-month refresher course is recommended for anyone who's likely to be involved in a CPR. And skills can deteriorate within a matter of weeks. Secondarily, when we talk about preparedness, we want to make sure that we have a stocked crash cart. This crash cart can be anything from an old toolbox to a tackle box to a big, large metal container that you have in your hospital and on your ICU floor that contains everything you need for CPR. It should be centrally located and routinely audited to make sure that every tool that we need is in it and ready to go. It should also include any necessary equipment to carry out a successful CPR, including but not limited to endotracheal tubes, IV catheters of varying gauges and lengths, needles and syringes of varying gauges and size, drugs such as your vasopressors like epinephrine and vasopressin, your parasympatholytics like atropine, antiarrhythmic drugs like lidocaine and amiodarone, and reversal agents like naloxone and flumazenil. Last but not least, and not always completely necessary, is an alkalinizing agent like sodium bicarbonate. Additionally, your crash cart should have access to intravenous fluids, some variety of a balanced crystalloid, if you will, and fluid line administration sets so that you can set your patient up on IV fluids as soon as needed. It's also very helpful to have around your crash cart posted on the wall cognitive aids. These include algorithm and dosing charts, a CPR flow chart, a CPR record keeping sheet so someone can be monitoring all steps of the CPR while you're doing it, and an auditing stocking sheet for the crash cart. You should also ideally have a glucometer, an ambu bag, and suction tubing. There are two main aspects of CPR, basic life support and advanced life support. We'll take a few minutes to talk about basic life support. Basic life support includes all of the steps that we need to take upon immediate recognition of cardiopulmonary arrest. You're caring for a patient under general anesthesia and all of a sudden you recognize a sign of cardiopulmonary arrest. Whether that's a drop in your in title, a change in your ECG, or an immediate change in your SpO2. We often think about the ABCs of basic life support, but actually what we really want to focus on is the CABs, or circulation, airway, and breathing, or CAB. Circulation means starting chest compressions immediately. It's important to remember that well-executed chest compressions only restore approximately 30% of normal blood flow. Therefore, we have to make sure that we're performing them as efficiently as possible. Initiation of chest compressions should start at 100 to 120 beats per minute using a width of one third to one half of the chest depth whenever you're doing your compressions. You can use a metronome or songs like Staying Alive by the Bee Gees to keep time and make sure that your chest compressions are being delivered appropriately. The compressions are delivered in cycles of two minutes to optimize development of adequate coronary perfusion pressure. 
In that time frame, it takes about 60 seconds of continuous chest compressions before perfusion pressure reaches its max, meaning we really want to go that full two minutes before we change out people who are performing the compressions. It's also important to remember that decompression or relaxation of the chest is just as important as compression, as this is when the majority of myocardial perfusion occurs and leaning on the chest during compressions will reduce filling of the heart by preventing full elastic recoil of the chest and must be prevented. Again, there are two main goals of chest compressions. One, we want to restore carbon dioxide elimination and oxygen uptake at the level of the lungs by restoring blood flow to the lungs. And we want to ensure that we're getting delivery of oxygen to the tissues to restore organ function and metabolism by providing systemic arterial blood flow. There are two main models to explain forward flow of blood during chest compressions. The first is the cardiac pump theory. This means we're directly compressing the left and right ventricles during our compressions and increasing pressure within the ventricles, opening up the pulmonic and aortic valves and allowing blood to flow to the lungs and tissues respectively. When the chest then recoils back between compressions, it creates negative pressure within the chest and draws blood into the ventricles before the next compression takes place, thereby restoring our ability to create forward blood flow. The second theory is the thoracic pump theory. This states that an increase in overall intrathoracic pressure during chest compressions forces blood from the thorax into systemic circulation. So rather than the heart acting as a pump, it acts as a conduit for blood to flow through. We use these two theories and patient shape and size to decide how we wanna place our hands during chest compressions. For example, with narrow or keel-chested dogs, like your greyhounds, it's recommended to place the hands directly over the heart, thereby utilizing the cardiac pump theory. For dogs with medium to round chest, the hands are placed over the widest part of the chest and utilize the thoracic pump theory. And for flat-chested dogs, like your English bulldogs that are kind of more barrel-shaped, if you will, the patients are typically placed in dorsal recumbency so on their back, and you place your hands directly over the sternum, just like you would with a human, thereby utilizing the cardiac pump theory. For cats and small dogs, we want to perform chest compressions right over the heart, so we utilize the cardiac pump theory. Next, we'll talk about airway and breathing, so the AB to our cab. Where people tend to have primary cardiac arrest, dogs and cats have a higher incidence of primary respiratory arrest. Therefore, immediate early airway management and ventilation are strongly recommended. Patients should be intubated immediately and ventilation or breathing is provided with an oxygen line and an ambu bag at a rate of 10 breaths per minute with a short inspiratory time of approximately one second and a tidal volume of approximately 10 mils per kg. We should try to avoid hyperventilation or excessive breathing, as this can increase cerebral vasoconstriction and leads to decreased cerebral blood flow and oxygen delivery. If an airway is not able to be obtained via intubation, there is an option for mouth to snout ventilation as an alternative breathing strategy, although it's not quite as successful, but it can still be used. If we're using mouth to snout ventilation, we want to close the animal's mouth firmly with one hand and extend the neck to align the snout with the spine. The rescuer then makes a seal over the patient's nose with their mouth and inflates the lungs by blowing firmly into the nares and watching the chest expand. A ratio of 30 chest compressions to two breaths is performed if the patient is not intubated, intubated and you're utilizing mouth to snout breathing. For monitoring associated with basic life support, we talk about ECG. The ECG is only accurate during your pauses between your two minute cycles of basic life support when you're rotating your compressors. However, you should perform and check your ECG very, very quickly. You also want to check your pulse at the same time to see if it correlates with what you're seeing on the screen. Capnography or evaluation of entitled carbon dioxide is arguably the most important tool to use during CPR. It's not susceptible to motion artifact like the ECG is, 
and it can help to confirm correct endotracheal tube placement. It's also an indicator of chest compression efficacy. Your end tidal CO2 substantially increases upon return of spontaneous circulation and is a valuable indicator of return of spontaneous circulation during CPR. A very low ETCO2 during CPR of less than 10 to 15 millimeters per, merc per mercury is associated with reduced likelihood for return of spontaneous circulation. So that pretty much covers it for basic life support, but let's take a step further and talk about advanced life support. This includes utilization of drug therapy during our CPR. So ideally, one of the first things you wanna do, depending on what was going on with your patient, is to reverse all drugs that might have been used to cause sedation in your patient. So if you've sedated with some form of an opioid, you can administer naloxone. And if you've sedated with midazolam or diazepam, you can then use flumazenil. Next, we'll talk about our vasopressors. So epinephrine is a catecholamine that works by sti stimulating alpha and beta receptors in the periphery. This increases peripheral vasoconstriction and improves return of blood flow to the heart. Low-dose epinephrine is associated with higher rates of survival to discharge in humans than using high-dose epinephrine. So you ideally want to start with a low dose like 0.01 mg per kg intravenously or intraosseously every other cycle of CPR early in CPR with higher doses utilized only after prolonged CPR efforts. This is where your flow charts will really come in handy because you can look at your patient's weight and get a dose really quickly rather than having to calculate it off the top of your head. Vasopressin is another form of vasopressor that acts at V1 receptors, so a little bit of a different function than epinephrine. And the nice thing about vasopressin is that even in acidic environments, like you might see if your patient has experienced a cardiac respiratory arrest, it can still be efficacious. It can also be used on its own or in conjunction with epinephrine. Next, we'll talk about atropine. Atropine is a parasympatholytic. It's particularly useful in patients with cardiac arrest associated with increased vagal tone or high tone in the vagus nerve, which can be seen in cases where you have a lot of gastrointestinal pain, so those acute vomiting diarrhea patients. A dose of 0.04 mg per kg intravenously every other cycle of CPR, so about every three to five minutes, is given. However, it does have a long half-life, so it might not actually be beneficial to repeat it more than once or twice during CPR. Last but not least, we'll talk about our antiarrhythmic drugs. Amiodarone is the most useful drug if you have ventricular fibrillation, which is resistant to electrical defibrillation. So, for example, you have a patient that you've been monitoring for ventricular tachycardia. All of a sudden, you see your waveform change to a very irregular rhythm associated with ventricular fibrillation, and your patient is exhibiting signs of cardiopulmonary arrest. At that time, if it's been less than four minutes since you've developed ventricular fibrillation, you would attempt electrical defibrillation. If it's been longer than four minutes that the ventricular fibrillation has been going on, you would do a round of CPR and then perform electrical defibrillation. If for some reason your electrical defibrillation is not successful, that's when you would reach for your amiodarone. Unfortunately, amiodarone has been associated with anaphylaxis, so we do have to monitor for that if we get the patient back and have return of spontaneous circulation. If you don't have access to amiodarone, which a lot of hospitals don't, lidocaine is a less effective but alternative option that you can use. We'll also talk briefly about intravenous fluid therapy. So IV fluid therapy can be a little bit counterintuitive sometimes. It's really easy to want to reach for it very, very quickly in patients that are experiencing cardiac or respiratory arrest. However, you really want to think about what was going on with your patient beforehand. So if you have a vomiting or diarrhea dog that comes through the door and you suspect high vagal tone and a lot of dehydration, that's a great candidate for IV fluids and you would administer them. However, if you have a known heart failure patient or a patient that had been hospitalized for a few days and was suspected to be euvolemic, giving IV fluids can actually be detrimental and we really want to avoid doing that. After IV fluids, we'll briefly touch on corticosteroids. It used to be really, really popular to just kind of throw steroids at everything. However, it's not recommended for use during CPR as there is no beneficial evidence to show that it makes a difference in return of spontaneous circulation or survival to discharge.
Now let's talk about alkalinizing agents, or sodium bicarbonate. Metabolic acidosis, so a pH of less than 7.35, is appreciated in patients where you have a rest that is lasting greater than 10 to 15 minutes. Therefore, administration of bicarbonate at a dose of one milliequivalent per kilogram, diluted and given intravenously, may be considered in these patients. Now to talk about the interesting subject of electrical defibrillation. Electrical defibrillation, which I already kind of briefly touched on a few minutes ago, is indicated for ventricular fibrillation and pulseless ventricular tachycardia. There are two forms of defibrillators. One is monophasic and the other is biphasic. Monophasic defibrillators deliver current in one direction between the paddles across the chest, and you have to use a power of about four to six joules per kg. Biphasic defibrillators deliver current in one direction, then reverse the polarity and deliver it in the opposite direction. They're more oftentimes recommended because you need to use lower energy output for them and therefore you have less risk of myocardial injury. Biphasic electrical defibrillators, you only need a power of about two to four joules per kg. That wraps up this module on a brief review of CPR. Please proceed to the next module. Thanks.